we need to understand the meaning of the word resurrection. The Greek word that's translated means to stand up out of. So resurrection is standing up out of death and out of the grave. In the scripture we've just quoted, we saw that man consists of three elements, spirit, soul, and body. It's important to understand that it's the body that dies and it's the body that will be resurrected. The spirit and the soul never need to be resurrected because they've never passed into death. So we are talking about the resurrection of the body. This is very important. Now, I want to deal a little bit this morning with what the Bible shows about what happens to people after they die. I've discovered that this is a matter of universal interest. It doesn't really matter what nationality or what culture you belong to. Everybody is interested to know what happens after death. And the Bible gives a pretty clear picture. And I'm going to try to outline this picture and then show how it will affect the resurrection. Um, in Luke chapter 16, verses 22 through 26, <clears throat> Jesus gives us his picture of what happens. Uh, and I want to point out that this is never called a parable. There's the parable, the word parable is not used in connection with this. We'll start with Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously or lived luxuriously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from here, from there, pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father Abraham, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And how true that proved in experience. Even when Jesus rose from the dead, those who did not believe Moses and the prophets did not recognize what had happened. That's a very solemn thought. Sometimes we expect some tremendous supernatural visitation and say if that happens, we'll be convinced. But God says, you have my word. That's all you need. If you believe it and obey it, it will take you through. Now I want to point out certain features that are indicated by this story of the rich man and Lazarus. There are five features. First of all, there was persistence of personality after death. The rich man was still the rich man and Lazarus was still Ra Lazarus. Neither of them lost their identities. Now some people teach us that after death everything just fades away and there's nothing left. That's not scriptural. We continue in the same personality after death as we lived in in life. Secondly, there was recognition of persons. 
the rich man recognized Lazarus and he recognized Abraham and Lazarus recognized the rich man. Third, there was recollection of life on earth. Both the rich man and Lazarus could recall the circumstances of their lives before they died. Fifth, there was a consciousness of their present condition. The rich man was in torment, his tongue burning with fire. Lazarus was in comfort and peace in the bosom of Abraham. And fifthly, there was a complete separation between the righteous and the unrighteous. Each of them had an appointed place and neither could cross from one to the other. Let me add, the, let me say those five things again because they're very, very important and they contradict a lot of theories that are being put around today. Number one, there was persistence of personality, no loss of identity. Number two, there was recognition of persons. Number three, there was recollection of life on earth. Number four, there was a consciousness of present conditions after death. And number five, there was a complete separation between the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, what happened to those who died before Jesus himself died and rose from the dead? Because that event bisected human history and the destiny of souls before and after the death and resurrection of Jesus is not the same. The death and resurrection of Jesus produced a change actually in the whole universe. It was the most decisive event in the history of the universe and it affected what happened to those who died. Let's deal now with what happened before the death of Jesus. We've seen already in this story of the rich man and Lazarus that all departing souls passed into a place which is called in Hebrew Sheol and in Greek Hades. And the Greek word Hades means the unseen world. So all alike, whether righteous or unrighteous, passed into this unseen realm called Hades or Sheol. This was a place of departed souls. But there were two completely separate areas for the righteous and the unrighteous. And notice everybody was either righteous or unrighteous, as I was saying yesterday. There's nothing in between. You can't be halfway righteous and halfway unrighteous. You've got to end up in one or other of those two places. The, the area for the righteous is called Abraham's bosom meaning, I suppose, that Abraham was the father of all who believe, welcomed them there and comforted them. That's my understanding. Now, what happened to Jesus when he died? Jesus was a perfect man. He too had spirit, soul and body. And there's a different statement made about each of those three elements in Jesus' personality. In Luke 23 and verse 46, we find out what happened to the spirit of Jesus when he died. Luke 23, verse 46. It says, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, and I believe what he cried out was, it is finished. He said, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. He died. He expired. So his spirit was commended to the Father. Now there are some things that I can't explain. I can make these statements that there may be areas in which I cannot give you a further explanation. What happened to the soul of Jesus? In Acts chapter 2, when speaking on the day of Pentecost, Peter quoted Psalm 16 as an experience of Jesus and not of David the psalmist. And he says, David spoke in Psalm 16 concerning Jesus. These words, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad because Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope 
because you will not leave my soul in Hades. So the soul of Jesus went down into that realm of departed spirits. It's also stated in 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit or in the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of, of God waited in the days of Noah. So Jesus went down into Hades, and there are details of this which I cannot explain to you, but I can tell you what the Bible says. He made a proclamation. This translation says he preached, but it's the word to proclaim. It does not mean necessarily that he preached the gospel, but he made a proclamation. My guess is, he said, from now on, I'm the ruler in this place. I have the keys of death and of Hades, and you are answerable to me for everything that goes on from now on. That's just my theory. It may not be right. Now, meanwhile, Jesus' body was laid in the tomb. In John 19, verse 40 and following, we read what happened after he died on the cross. Jesus 19, uh, John 19, verse 40 and 42. It says, Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. They would wrap a body in strips of linen, but they would include a great quantity of spices because the body would be expected to decompose and give out a stench. Now the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus. And we don't need to go any further with that. We also read the account of how after the resurrection of Jesus, the apostles and the women went to the tomb. They all knew where he, his body had been buried, but they didn't find him there, praise God. So, what happened to the total personality of Jesus? He committed his spirit to the Father. His soul descended into Hades, and he made a proclamation there and probably did a lot of other things and his body was laid in the tomb. But when he rose, his total personality was again united. He was a complete person, spirit, soul, and body. Now, what happened through the death and resurrection of Jesus affected the universe. It also determined the destiny of souls at death. From that time onwards, since the resurrection of Jesus, the destiny of the righteous is not to go into Hades. It has a different and a much more glorious destiny. Let me see, give you two examples. When they stoned Stephen, and he was at the point of death, in Acts chapter 7, verse 57 and following. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him, that Stephen, with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knew that his spirit was to go directly to Jesus. This is the change that has taken place because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And because Stephen prayed that, Saul of Tarsus could be saved. If Stephen had not released him from his guilt, he could never have been saved. That's a wonderful thought. But I want to emphasize that for the true believer who has been cleansed in the blood of Jesus and lived faithfully for God, 
The destiny at death is that the spirit ascends directly to Jesus. Paul also refers to this in Philippians chapter 1. He says he doesn't know which, is, which to choose. Shall he continue to live here or shall he go and be with Jesus? And this is what he says. Verse, Philippians 1 verse 23. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul was absolutely confident that if at that time he died, he would be with Christ. That is one great change affected by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Another thing that happened, and there are some things that I can tell you, but I can't fill in all the details because I don't know them, is that the departed souls of the righteous who were in the bosom of Abraham were released. And let's look at that in Ephesians chapter 4. And this is quoting Psalm 68. And it's speaking about the resurrection of Jesus. Therefore, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, my understanding, and many Bible commentators will understand, that he led captivity captive was he released the souls of the departed righteous and took them with him up to heaven. You see, they could not be released until the penalty for sin had actually been paid. God accepted them as righteous because they had put their faith in a sacrifice that had not yet taken place. They were looking forward to the promised sacrifice. But until the sacrifice had actually been offered, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, they could not be released. But after he had sacrificed himself, he went down into Hades and at some point and some way, he took them with him. That's how I believe. They had been the captives of sin and of death, but he took captivity captive. They became the captives of Jesus and of righteousness, which to me is exciting. Now, the next thing that's very, very important is this. The resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee of our resurrection. That is, if we are to to totally committed to Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, speaking again about the resurrection of Jesus, Paul says, He, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. So Jesus is the head, we believers are the body. He's also the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence of the first place. So he is the firstborn from death. He's the head of a totally new creation. He's the head of a new race, the God-man race, in which the nature of God and man are combined in one person. Now, he's the head of the body, and he's the firstborn from the dead, and the resurrection is compared to a birth out of death. And this is such a beautiful picture. In a natural birth, normally what part of the body emerges first? The head, that's right. And when the head emerges, what do you know? You know the rest of the body is going to follow. And so the resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee that his body will follow him in resurrection. Now, also, the resurrection of Jesus in his body is a pattern for ours. I hope you're getting excited about this. If you're not, I'm really not communicating. You see, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, For our citizenship is in heaven, that those of us who've been born again, committed to live for Jesus, we live on earth, we're citizens of a country here on earth, but our real citizenship is in heaven. And if you are a citizen of a, of a country, you have to have a passport, you know that? So we have a passport, it's the blood of Jesus. Our citizenship is in heaven, 
from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice a mark of true Christians is that we are eagerly waiting for the Savior. And then it says, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now that's the translation, but it's not literal. And if I may give you a literal translation, it makes something very vivid. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. You see, you may not realize it, but you and I live in a body of humiliation. We've been humiliated because of sin. But Jesus is going to change this body of humiliation into the likeness of the body of his glory. Isn't that exciting? This body is going to change. We'll look a little later at some of the details of the change. But let me just point out one very relevant fact. In 1 John chapter 3, John says this, <clears throat> verse 2 and 3 Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be in other words, we haven't yet seen the kind of body we're going to have but we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is when he is revealed and we see him our bodies will be changed into the likeness of his body but I want you to notice the next verse because it's very important Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now you may tell me that you're hoping for the resurrection and it's not my business to argue with you. But if you are really hoping, there's something you're doing. You're purifying yourself. And what is the standard of purity? Jesus, just as he is pure. And if you tell me that you're looking forward to the resurrection, but I see no evidence that you're purifying yourself, that you're seeking to make yourself more pure and more holy. I say you're probably self-deceived. You aren't really looking forward. You're just using religious language. Because this is the mark of everyone who is truly looking forward to this exchange from the body of humiliation to the body of glory. Let me read those words just again. Everyone who has this hope in him, Jesus, purifies himself just as he is pure. Do you have that mark? Is that evidence in your life that you are really expecting the return of Jesus? Now, our body will be like his, and we observe in the record of the Gospels that he was not limited by time or space. He could ascend to heaven, come down again. He could enter a room with all the doors closed, he could appear in one form to one person, another form to another person. He had a very, shall we say, flexible body. And I believe we'll have a similar kind of body. Now, people say, well, what will that body be like? And Paul deals with that question in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 through 44. I'm sorry, verse 35 through 38, excuse me. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 38. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? I'm sure most of us have felt like asking that. Foolish one, Paul says, it's, fool, it's Paul who's saying it, not me. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And then he goes on with this example of the seed. And what you sow, you do not sow the body that shall be, but mere grain or mere seed, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. Now there are two things combined there. There's continuity and there's change. If you sow an apple pip into the ground, you don't get an orange. The nature of the seed determines the nature of the life that will come out of the seed. So there is continuity, 
but there's also change. The, the, the apple tree that comes out of the apple pip is not really very like the pip. So there will be continuity. You'll be the same, but there'll be a tremendous supernatural change. What you sow determines what comes up, but nevertheless what comes up is totally different from what was sown. So our body is sown in burial into the ground as a seed. The same body will come forth, but a totally different kind of body. Now, Jesus was very careful to emphasize that when he rose, it was the same body that had been crucified. We look in Luke 24. The disciples were all scared, very much so, when he first appeared. They couldn't really believe what had happened. But Jesus said to them in Luke 24, verses 38 and 39, after his resurrection appearance, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my side, that it is I myself. In his hands and his side, he showed them the evidence of crucifixion. He wanted to make very plain that it was the same body but transformed. And then, <coughs> sorry, in John chapter 20, uh, there's a further record, record of the resurrection of Jesus. It says, He stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. That's the traditional <coughs> Middle East greeting. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Why did he do that? To show them that it was the same body that they'd seen crucified. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Why did he do that? To show them that it was the same body that they'd seen crucified. Well, you remember Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas said, well, I will not believe unless I can see his hands and his side and put my hand into his side. So a week later, Jesus appeared again. And in verse 27, he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side in other words the wound was still such that thomas could put his hand in so this is very important because when you get resurrected you're not going to have a new body you're going to have a different body but it'll be the same body changed now paul tells us of five specific changes that will take place in our resurrection body. And he speaks of this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 to 44, and verse 52 and 53. So we'll read those verses, 42 through 44, and 50, where are we? 52 and 53. So 42, Paul says, So all also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. You know what 
corruption is, it's decay. Anything that decays is corrupt. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, there is a spiritual body. Now that's hard to understand. Unfortunately, the translation doesn't help very much. This is one of the problems of the English translation, and every translation seems to have the same problem. The Greek word is psuchikos, which is directly derived from the Greek word for a soul, which is psuche. There's only one reasonable translation, which is soulish. It is sown a soulish body, it is raised a spiritual body, and you see there's a distinction between spirit and soul. Now some languages, for instance Swedish, has a word for soulish. So does Danish. And really English has got to have that word rightly to represent what the Bible teaches. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, the soulish man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. But the translations all say the natural man, the carnal man, etc. It all obscures this tremendously important distinction between the soulish and the spiritual. So it's sown, it's buried a soulish body, it's raised a spiritual body. Now, ask me to explain that and I'm not sure I can. I know what it says. But I suggest to you that in our present body the soul makes the decisions. If I want to go through the door, my soul says we'll go through the door and my feet obey. And so in a sense our spirit is dependent upon our soul. You remember what David said to his soul? Soul, praise the Lord. Come on, get moving. The spirit, you see, wanted to praise the Lord, but the soul was sluggish in response. That's apparently the way it was. We have to stir up our souls from our spirits to do the right thing. We know we should be praising the Lord, but our souls are sluggish, and so we have to stir them up. Now, this may not satisfy you, but it's the best I can do. When it's raised, it'll be a spiritual body. In other words, the spirit will control the body direct. How? I don't know. Now let's look on also in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 52 and 53. It says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal was put on immortality. Corruptible is that which is subject to decay, mortal is that which is subject to death. So if you take those two passages together, there are five specific changes that take place in our bodies. <clears throat> From corruptible to incorruptible, subject to decay, no longer subject to decay. From mortal to immortal, subject to death, no longer subject to death, from dishonor to glory, where any body that's being buried in a sense is a rather pitiable thing. That's how we go down. When we come up, we come up with glory. It's in weakness that it's sown, but it's in power that it's raised. And it's sown, as we've already said, a soulish body comes forth a spiritual body. Let me just give you those five changes again. From corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal, from dishonor to glory, from weakness to power, and from soulish to spiritual. Now, the resurrection of Jesus is an absolutely key element of Christian doctrine. We cannot set it aside and call ourselves Christians. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, Paul says, If Christ is not risen from the dead, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. And in verse 17, If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. In other words, the forgiveness of our sins is absolutely linked to the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus has not been raised, the gospel is false, our faith is futile, 
and we are still in our sins. And you see there are many eminent theologians and other people like that who have denied the reality of the resurrection of the body of Jesus. They are still in their sins. They are not saved. You cannot be saved unless you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus. Now let's go on to <clears throat> the attestation of the resurrection of Jesus. What evidence is given us in the Bible the resurrection of Jesus? And it's an interesting fact, the primary evidence is not the evidence of eyewitnesses. The primary evidence is the evidence of Scripture. That takes priority over human witnesses. So let's look at some of the passages in the Old Testament that predict the resurrection of Jesus. This is a very, very interesting subject, and I wish I had more time to deal with it. But let's look at one statement of, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> of this salvation, which Peter is talking about, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you. So the Old Testament prophets had a real dilemma. I wonder if you can understand it, because it's an amazing dilemma. Peter says the Spirit of Christ was in them, the Spirit of the Messiah. So under that inspiration, they spoke in the first person of things that would happen to Jesus that never happened to them. And that must have been difficult. I don't know whether you've ever put yourself in the place of those Old Testament prophets. But they said the most extraordinary things about themselves, which never happened. Let me give you just two examples. In Psalm 22, and verse 16, this is what they call a messianic psalm. In other words, it's an unfolding of the revelation of the Messiah. Psalm 22, verse 16, David is speaking in the first person, and he says, Dogs have surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Never happened to David. How do you think he felt when he said those words? I have no idea. But he was inspired by the spirit of Christ that was in him. So he spoke in the first, first person of things that would happen to the Messiah that never happened to him. And then we can look in Isaiah chapter 50. There are countless other examples. I'm just giving you two very clear examples. Isaiah 50, verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the, hair, the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Never happened in the life of Isaiah. Happened in the ministry of Jesus, but it's written in the first person. Can you understand what I'm saying? It was the Spirit of Messiah in them, through the Holy Spirit, that predicted what would happen to the Messiah, to Jesus, but never happened to them. And so no wonder they searched what manner of time they were speaking about. I marvel at the faith of those men that they had the faith to receive that. I thank God for them, because this is the first confirmation of the resurrection of Christ, that it was predicted in the Scriptures. In Psalm 16, which is quoted by the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, we have a very amazing outline of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Psalm 16, beginning at verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now that could have been true of David, but it was also true of the Messiah. So what happens is they say certain things which are true in their experience, then they move beyond their experience into something that never actually happened to them. Now he goes on, Therefore, <coughs> sorry, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. And if you 
want to turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 26, you'll find out what your glory is. Because Peter says, my tongue rejoices. Understand? I've told you that before. Your tongue is your glory because it's the one member that was put in your mouth to enable you to glorify God. So he says, therefore my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh also will rest in hope. In other words, though I will be buried, I will have the hope of resurrection. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, so that indicates that his soul went down to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. His body never suffered corruption, although it was a considerable period of time in the grave, because he had never committed sin, and sin is the sting that admits corruption to the body. And then it says, the final verse, you will show me the path of life, in your presence is fullness of joy, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That was fulfilled when Jesus was resurrected, he returned to the Father's presence, and there was fullness of joy. So that's one example. Another is in Psalm 71. Psalm 71, verses 20 and 21. This is an amazing psalm. It doesn't tell us who the psalmist was. You can look into the background if you want to, but he's addressing God and he says, you have shown me great and severe troubles, shall revive me again, bring me back to life, and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. That never happened to any psalmist. You shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. So that only applies to Jesus. He was buried, he was brought back to life, he was raised up, and his greatness was increased. He became the owner of the name that's exalted above every name. See, it never happened to the psalmist. It happened to Jesus. That's the spirit of Messiah in them, testifying beforehand the things that would follow. When you begin to absorb this truth, it is the most powerful attestation of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. And then there's one more interesting passage. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he said that the gospel consists of three facts. We looked at that the other day. Jesus died according to the scriptures, he was buried, and he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. Have you ever asked yourself what scripture says he would be raised on the third day? I've only been able to find one and it's extremely interesting because it goes far beyond the context. In Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he is torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us, bring us back to life. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. So that's a very clear prediction of resurrection on the third day. The interesting thing is that it doesn't speak about him in the singular, it speaks about us in the plural. Now, this is a revelation. If you turn to Ephesians chapter 2, you find how Paul applies this revelation. And you see, prophecy does not merely predict future events, but it predicts them in such a way as to show their real significance. It interprets them as well as predicts them. This is a perfect example. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. And this is written about all true believers. Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses. That's wonderful. He loved us even when we were dead. How many people can love a corpse? Now, what did he do? Three things. He made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. All that is in the past tense. So because of our identification with Jesus, we're, we're made alive, we're resurrected, and don't stop there, we are enthroned. That's our destiny. And Paul doesn't put it in the future. 
In essence, he says, if you can receive it, you're sharing the throne with Jesus right now. But this is the outworking of Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. See how marvelously the scripture interprets itself. Then Paul gives a list of human witnesses. That is not irrelevant, but is secondary. We just look at that briefly. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 8. Verse 4 says, he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Verse 5, that he was seen by Kephas, that's by Peter. Then by the twelve apostles. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some have fallen asleep. Most of them are still alive, which indicates they were probably pretty young when they saw him. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me also, as one born out of due time. That's a list of the people that were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, according to Jewish law, the testimony of any two reliable men was sufficient to establish something at law. But God has given far more than two testimonies to the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I want to speak about the importance of the resurrection. We cannot overestimate the importance of the resurrection of Jesus. It is the decisive fact of the history of the universe. The whole history of the universe, not just the human race, revolves around the fact of the resurrection of Jesus. First of all, it was God's vindication of Jesus. Remember, two courts had condemned him to death. A secular Roman court, a religious Jewish court. And when he was buried, he was under that condemnation. But when he rose, God vindicated his son. This is expressed in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came of the seed of David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. And that's a Jewish phrase of saying the Holy Spirit because actually the Hebrew for the Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness. Some translators don't realize that Paul was writing in Greek and thinking in Hebrew. Declared to be the Son of God with power by the Holy Spirit by the resurrection of the dead. So when Jesus came forth out of the tomb, God said, I've reversed those unjust decisions. I've vindicated my son. He never sinned. There's no cause for death in him, and by my Holy Spirit, I've raised him up. All right, now then, the resurrection of Jesus is the basis for our justification. If he wasn't raised, we'd still be, be in our sins. Paul says in Romans 4, verse 25, 26, Jesus was delivered up to death for our offenses and was raised for our justification. If he hadn't been raised, we could not be justified. We'd still be in our sins. And then he says about salvation in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. You understand, if you do not believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, you cannot be saved. It is essential for salvation. Unfortunately, there are multitudes of professing Christians who don't believe in the physical resurrection. None of them can know the peace and joy of sins forgiven. No matter what position they may occupy in the church. Then... The resurrection is the guarantee of Christ's power to save us. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, it says this, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, Jesus, since he ever lives to make intercession for us. If Jesus was still in the tomb, how could he save us? But because he's at the right hand of God, because he's atoned for our sins, because all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him, he's able to save us to the uttermost. I love that phrase. 
Somebody said from the guttermost to the uttermost. There's no limit to the power of Jesus to say he has all power. Then, and this again is very important, the resurrection is the completion of our redemption. Uh, listen, our destination ultimately is not heaven. It's wonderful that we'll be able to go to heaven, but that's just a stopping off place. Because while our spirits are in heaven, our bodies will still be moldering in the grave. That's not a complete salvation. Jesus died for the whole person. His salvation includes spirit, soul, and body. And that salvation is not complete until the resurrection. And Paul was very clear of this. He says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and following, he says, the aim and purpose of his whole life is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He wasn't concerned about getting to heaven. His ambition was to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Thank God when we die our spirits will go to heaven, but that's not the completion of redemption, because our bodies are still unredeemed. Paul set his sights on the resurrection. He said again in the next verse, not that I'm already attained, or I'm already perfect, perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was single-minded. He said, I haven't arrived, I haven't attained at the time that he was speaking. But he said, there's one thing I do, I press toward the goal. Romans 8, 23 also says this. In other words, salvation isn't complete until the resurrection. Romans 8, verse 23. It says in verse 22, the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And then it says, not only they, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Now let me ask you, is that true of you? You have the first fruits of the Spirit. Are you groaning within yourself? Are you eagerly waiting? What right do you, I, you or I have to suppose that God deals with us on a lesser level. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not given just to have a good time. It's given to prepare us for what lies ahead. I feel such a sense of solemnity right now. The next thing I want to say about the resurrection is it's the consummation of our union with Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says this. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, the dead who have been raised, in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's very interesting because there are two Greek words for air. One describes the higher rarefied air, the other the air nearer the earth's surface. The word that's used here is the lower air. So we won't go very far above the earth to meet the Lord. All right. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. After that, no more partings. We shall always be with the Lord and we shall always be with one another. Finally, and I have to say this rapidly, the resurrection will be in three phases. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. 
but each one of us in his own order. And here's the order. Three separate phases. First, Christ the first fruits. Then those who are Christ at his coming. And finally, the end, the final resurrection of all the remaining dead. Whom is Jesus coming back? Those that are Christ's. He's not coming back. He's not a thief. He's not going to take anything or anybody that doesn't belong to him. Do you really belong to him? Important question. Those are the ones he's coming back for. 